Hello, and welcome back to Hatchetman Nightbreed, the audio supplement to our, well, let's face it, long abandoned video format for Hatchetman here at LoungeGeeks.com. This is our horror podcast. We talk about horrible things because we're horrible people. And if you're not on board with that, I suggest you turn this off right now. No, please don't. We really need your viewership. So today, uh, I am joined by two very special guests, uh, Mr. Josh Johnson and Mr. Christopher Palmer, who are the co-directors of a new documentary entitled Rewind This. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to let you tell us what this exquisite documentary is all about. Hey. <laughs> well, it's about the home video revolution, the introduction of VHS into the marketplace in the late 70s, and then it follows that entire story up until today. So the collapse of video the transfer into other later formats, digital formats, and now the evaporation of all physical media entirely. And it kind of tells the human side of that story and the broader cultural side of that story. Sure, but we're not trying to like, you know, this is not an advocacy documentary. We're not trying to give away the answers of what what the future of video is. We have no uh, agenda with us, really. So we're just trying to figure out along with, you know, talking to the directors, talking to the fans, talking to the distributors, and the people who ran rental businesses and just trying to figure out what is the story of video, you know? And for our younger viewers, uh, VHS tapes were basically fatter, chunkier DVDs of not so high resolution and were the delivery system for the horror movies that we loved as kids uh, way back in the, in the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, so yeah, gentlemen, um, seeing as how you are spreading the good news of VHS and... Uh, I know you say you don't have an agenda, but I, w I kind of refer to this movie as um, the pulpit for the church of VHS, which is good because I'm currently recruiting followers. Uh, since that's what we're talking about today, I thought it would be fun to take a look back uh, at some of our favorite horror movies that, to this day, uh, have not made the leap from VHS to one of the fancier, schmancier formats. Uh, do, you, what, do one of you gentlemen want to lead this off? Well, when you brought this up, the first one that I thought about was an anthology movie called Nightmares. And mm. it's actually uh, taken from television episodes that uh, I believe didn't air or, you know, for whatever reason were too strong for TV. So they took those installments and edited it into a feature anthology film. And there's four segments in it. And two of them are particularly really good. There's one called The Bishop of Battle. Oh, uh, yes. Which is Emilio Estevez versus an arcade game. I am the Bishop of Battle, master of all I survey. And then there's another really strong segment. I don't remember the title of it, but it's basically uh, Lance Henriksen as a missionary versus the devil in the form of a truck. And I like to call oh, it yeah. Truckistopheles. <laughs> That is a good one. That is a good one. And there's like this, there's this great long history of video anthologies. I feel like this should, should be acknowledged, you know, and to have one that has not seen a better format, you know, is really quite a shame because that one in particular is, you know, it's just as good as uh, Fright Night in many ways, you know, or just as good as something uh, creep show. Definitely. No, and it's, it's funny. The, I remember I've seen this one, the, the Bishop of Battle segment, it, what I love about Nightmares is that every single segment, every single vignette of that movie seems to be cribbing heavily from an established horror entity. Um, the Bishop of Battle feels like a horror version of Tron. Um, the Truckistopheles, as you mentioned, feels like this weird mashup of the car and Tremors. It's, it's, it's very strange because the truck that's chasing him burrows underground and then leaps up oh, yeah, at the most opportune... Oh yeah, Tremors kind of like a worm, you yeah. know, totally reminds me of the kind of, uh, the, the sandworms from Beetlejuice, the way they go to underground like that. I love it. it. It is built graboid tough, that truck. And, uh, and actually there's one toward the end that's a, like a home, like ghost invasion movie with a giant rat that up until you get to the point with the giant rat feels like poltergeist. So it's just, it feels like it's just, it's borrowing heavily from all of these different horror movies, but also in a way that's making it its own and, and frankly, is one of the better anthologies that I've seen. And we're actually watching a very terrible uh, horror anthology as we record this. I'm not even sure anthology is the right word. Maybe clip show would be more appropriate. Uh, it seems yeah. more like TV. <laughs> it's got wraparound like that. Yeah, and basically it's called uh, Terror on Tape, and it's got this really hackneyed story about a man going into a video store run by Cameron Mitchell, 
Uh, and he's just showing this really dweeby guy clips from these terrible horror films to kind of scare the life out of him. Oh, his hair's turning white. Oh, yeah. See, that's comedy. That is just, you don't get that anymore. he's getting scared. Oh, boy. That, that is some gentle humor in the horror clip show. With a soft touch. Oh, gentlemen, please segue us out of this. I can't, I can't stop looking at it. What's, what's next on the, on the list here? Well, we actually just saw a movie yesterday that is one of the most fascinating movies we've talking seen. about Appointment with Fear? Appointment with Fear is a pretty amazing movie produced by Mustafa Akkad, who produced Halloween. And the director took his name off it. It's an Alan Smithy release. But I it, love that guy. His name is yeah. on some of the best VHS horror movies I've ever seen. The name gets around. I have no idea what the story of this movie is, and I just watched it yesterday. And I, I can't really explain <laughs> it to you, but there... Some of the things that are involved is uh, an Egyptian tree spirit. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of Egyptian mythology that they're trying to pull back on. Um, successful in that? Partially. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. There's, a lot of it takes place at this house, this mansion, with these series of pools. And I still don't know whose home it was. Pools. Yeah. Spas. Waiting pools. <laughs> the, it's got it's really that mansion that is featured in this thing is a character unto itself it is the height of 80s fashion it's got marble it's got arches it's got a stairwell to nothing nice that's it's just very mc escher very nice yes it's got sculpture art that you know is expensive but really has no depth to it just the essentials <laughs> of 80s style and fashion it also has i think our Probably our mutual favorite character, which is a hobo who lives in the ah. pickup truck of one of the ladies in the film, and will sometimes park her car for her when he's not sleeping or slash living in the back of her truck. Yeah, this huh. is the hobo helper is pretty much what this guy is, and it's just there, there's no indication that the audience should think this is anything abnormal. <laughs> that just every lady, every single lady, or you know man out there who needs a little extra help in their life should just have a hobo living in the back of their car or truck and they'll just help you throw them your keys they'll help you out when they're you know you, you got something to do and i feel like that just the mere fact that that was something that was involved with this this movie that that was not acknowledged as weird makes it that much more exciting and wonderful everyone should have a helper hobo in well, fact, I, mean, I think the alternate title for this movie was Helper Hobo. Helper Hobo, yeah. I think that's actually one of the amazing things about the movie is it does kind of sell you on that concept. Like, by the time you're done watching this movie, you do find yourself wishing you did have a Helper Hobo. It's or, actually a pretty effective presentation. Or at least a buddy, you know, who can sort of <laughs> philosophize for you in his own drunken manner, uh, you know, about what you're about to see. Like, one of the, my favorite lines that the Helper Hobo says is, uh, beware of gods in empty places. Not... <laughs> emblematic of the the movie itself there's no indication what the hell that could mean it's prophetic hobo wisdom yeah, right and there but, they're, but just you're left to try to figure it out yourself it's, you're given nothing you're given hardly even clues by this movie as to try to figure out what the hell is going on and that's what I love about it I feel like most horror movies are trying to give you too much this movie doesn't give you anything <laughs> you figure it out it's not my job nice well I'm actually going to throw into the mix a movie that's very near and dear to my heart uh, called New Year's Evil, oh, yeah, good which one. is a 1980-81 slasher film that takes place on, well, you guessed it, New Year's Eve, uh, and it falls into that weird, the weirdest of subgenres for horror that I love so much, which is the holiday horror film, wherein they try to take every special day on the calendar and sully it with a goodly amount of bloodshed. Uh, and up to that point, nobody had really done a New Year's Evil-themed horror film, on the one night they were celebrating New Year's Eve, he was out, ending their life. I'm going to commit murder at midnight. Call me evil. One of the great things about this movie is that there's a lot of... Uh, Simultaneously, there's a lot of uh, new wave music and punk music, as well as commentary on how terrible the music of that era was. Uh, one of my favorite shots is actually they cut from a, a concert that's going on in a hotel ballroom to a group of patients at a, a mental asylum, and you realize that the, the cut is seamless because they're doing the same dance at both places. So that's... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like commentary there. Yeah, more, smarter than it has any right to be in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's so endearing about a lot of these movies that actually has us returning to videotapes or searching out videotapes to watch them is that uh, there are great moments of total illogic in them. Absolutely. Which might be part of why, you know, they don't appeal to a larger audience and why they haven't made it to later formats. But there's a great, totally baffling moment in New Year's Evil where there are two cops in an alleyway and they hear the sound of a cat and their re reaction to that is to say that they need to call for backup. Yes, yes, because, oh my God, if they have to face this cat on their own, I mean, they're only two men, and that's a cat! So, oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess I see what you mean now. Yeah, it's sort of the, it seems like cops should be saying this kind of thing, and it seems like a real movie, but the logic behind it, just one step behind of it, makes it, the whole thing undone, which is so good about some of the shot, you know, straight on video kind of horror. Absolutely. And what's, what's also interesting and absurd about it is that it stars... Uh, an actress who is probably best known as Pinky Tuscadero on Happy Days. And by best known, I mean possibly known by a couple of people. And uh, what one of the things that I love about this movie so much is that it is, in a lot of ways, just a, a by-the-numbers 80s slasher film. And in other ways, it's, it's actually got some decent suspense to it. It's got some decent twists. The music is out-fucking-standing. I'm sorry, I, I don't care... How cheesy it is, the opening song by uh, a band whose name I've forgotten because I've never learned, uh, is is just, it's thematic and it's rocking and, and, and you, when you hear it, you don't even care what's going to follow because you're immediately on board for it. Yeah, I'll definitely back you up on the music. The soundtrack is fantastic and, you know, I don't know, there's a long tradition of good... Uh, punk and new wave uh, music that comes with some of the best of 80s horror. I feel like that just comes part and parcel. Like um, Alone in the Dark is one yes. in particular I think about that has great horror um, and great music and even comments during the thing about, you know, how this music is sort of the end of us all. And, and there's another, there's a, a similar moment to the one in New Year's Evil in Alone in the Dark when Jack Palance, who is a escaped mental patient, wanders into a new wave club where they're dancing mm -hmm. and he gets this look on his face and you can immediately read what he's thinking which is i'm home these people get me these people are exactly like me so it kind of makes that same statement in alone in the dark which is yeah it's almost a, a total acceptance of this kind of counterculture or what was considered kind of on the edge fringe marginal culture is you know uh the killers can find their their home there absolutely i think i will i will throw black roses into that mix as well because mm. as silly a monster movie and as silly a quote-unquote satanist movie is that i only use the quote fingers because the satanists in that movie worship in a box using yankee candle company candles and a uh, pentagram that they drew with lipstick so i, I their their evilness is kind of dubious but uh, as silly as that is, the music in that movie is is also pretty phenomenal. So you're right. I think there is a long tradition of it's almost an inverse proportion to the the quality of the movie and the quality of the music in the movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think that actually leads us to another film that continues a lot of the things we've been talking about, which is a movie that has Satan in it, has new wave music, is stuck on DV or stuck on VHS, and also is an anthology film. Which, which by is, the way, is the recipe for a movie that I will love. Please continue. Are you familiar with Night Train to Terror? I am very familiar with Night Train to Terror. Okay. Oh my god. That, that is another movie that has that wonderful sense of illogic about it. it the wraparound oh. segment is God and the Devil. Basically playing a game for people's souls. On a train, <sighs> and the other passengers on the train are a new wave band that you get to see a performance of. And, you know, the actual segments in it, the stories are unfinished or partially finished feature films mm -hmm. that they just dumped into this as stories, two of which feature the actor Richard Mole. Richard Mole. Characters. He shows up in two different movies within this anthology film. Uh, by the way, calling it an anthology film is both an insult to anthologies and films, uh, but it is one of those movies that, like you were saying, you watch and you can't believe how little is provided in terms of context, in terms of story, uh, but the, the opening... <laughs> The opening music number where the uh, the band invites you to dance with them and then says, well, hey, everybody's got something to do, everybody but you.
fitting message for the movie which is you're not doing anything anyway so watch this yeah and that's a great narrative structure too to involve <laughs> uh a you know god and the devil mm. uh telling you stories and that's that's the the outward sort of narrative structure that you keep going back to but you know using the uh the new wave band as sort of the uh the figure of us all aren't we all the new wave band on the train <laughs> in transit to yeah, someplace. Because the basic idea is that this train is going to crash and all of these stupid new wave punkers are going to die. So they're basically negotiating for which one of them is going to get the souls of this. First of all, why God would want to bother? Why either of them would want to bother with the new souls? New age of souls. New age souls are particularly cheap when, yeah. as as when it comes to souls. Literally a dime a dozen. Uh, but it, it's funny to watch them argue. And, and their arguments are these vignettes, which when you get to the end of them, you realize are not cogent arguments for anything. And yet they're like, you see? No, I don't. You're going to have to give me a little bit more. Well, it betrays the origins of the film, which, of course, is an anthology film designed around stories that didn't have any actual intended purpose. You know, it's a total... It's a perfect example of exploitation filmmaking at that time, taking existing material and finding another way to get it out there without having to actually shoot a complete film. Right. right. And I've actually seen one of the... What, basically what they did is they took three existing films, uh, existing they were shot, I don't know where they were ever exhibited, but I have since tracked down on DVD, mind you, uh, the fully completed version of one of the films featured, which is The Suicide Club, and I will, I, I must say, the version in, <laughs> the version in Night Train to Terror makes a lot more sense than the finished version, so I applaud them for hacking and slashing it and, and shoehorning it into this film. Oh, uh, jeez, what? How, where do we go from Night Train to Terror? Another anthology, I guess? I, I think so. Definitely. You got another one in mind? <laughs> no, but it was a good suggestion. That was a good, wow, was a good was segue. a perfect segue. Yeah. And I, wish, I wish I'd had one, because it would have been perfect. Well, I'll tell you, like, on a, uh, before we have any other examples, I'll tell you why I like the anthology in particular. I feel like it's almost like a, a, a good sketch comedy does not have to to pull in a beginning or an ending mm -hmm. and a uh, horror anthology gets to the meat just like a good sketch comedy just like you know you think of good sketch comedy like uh, 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 Monty Python and the, you know any of the Monty Python flying circus stuff it, it starts in the middle it ends before it's over right and then it moves on to something that is using some of that same verbiage or some of the same backgrounds and you just link into another wing without trying to wrap it all up and a pretty little bow. And that's what I love about anthologies is they just take take you to the best parts. And, you know, even if the, the wrapping is, is kind of cheap and, you know, it's like, you know, a stepfather's loose attempts with some duct tape and something like that, you know, <laughs> a few days after the fact, you know, a belated birthday, whatever, you know, it, it might be covered in whiskey. It might be, you know, full of uh, tears. But, you know, that, that Barbie that's in that box is, is good. It's, <laughs> it's a totally viable thing. I, I like your, your sketch comedy analogy because really what you're doing with these anthology horror films is, you know, in sketch comedy you're getting to the punchline and in the anthology horror films and the vignettes you're just getting to the twist and you're not letting the audience think about it too much because if they do, they'll realize that you're full of shit. So you just kind of have to move on as quickly as possible and uh, that's that's something, it's, it's almost like the snake oil salesman of, of the horror film. It's like, I'm going to sell you a bill of goods and then once you realize it's crap, you're already, well, I'm already on to the next town. And I think the other similarity that it has to sketch comedy is that if you're watching a sketch show and one particular sketch maybe isn't to your particular style or sensibilities, it's going to be over soon and you're going to be on to another sketch that might be. And they try to do that with these anthology films is provide a variety of different horror scenarios. So even if you don't like it, 15 minutes later, you're on to the next thing and hopefully you'll appreciate that more than the previous one. And I mean, if you're like a lot of consumers of horror, you're in for the boobs you're in for the gore, you're in for the chase and the twist, you're in for the goodies that are, the, that's the middle stuff. And that's what's great about VHS is because they were, they were being released in a time when that really was paramount. 
when all that really mattered was making the movie, one, as entertaining as possible, and two, and or failing that, uh, to provide as much of those goodies as you mentioned. And I think that that's something that, in a lot of modern horror films, they just take themselves far too seriously. Right. Well, we're looking at an example of that right now. Terror on Tape is playing in the background, and Terror on Tape is essentially just a compilation of those goodies. It is it is the nudity and the intense violence with little wraparounds, and I feel like you don't see product like this as much anymore, where it really is just everything that you most want stripped down to the bare essentials. It's all thriller, no filler. Right. And last time I, th- I think that I've seen this sort of thing recently, and I feel like it's become out of fashion like there's this expectation that it's got to be this huge franchise it's got to be final destination one through five Mm -hmm. plus then some which don't get me wrong i love final destination there's a there's a place for that rube goldberg sort of killing off kids that way Mm -hmm. but uh the the few recently that have come out with good anthologies that do justice to the the long tradition of horror anthology i gotta say in my opinion uh three extremes and three extremes too oh yeah both of those have done just a fantastic job. These are the, the Korean horror films, correct? Uh, it's a variety of variety. Asian oh. countries. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and one in particular that I like, which I've seen the expansive version just recently, uh, is The Short Dumplings. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, who was that by? Uh, Fruit Chan from Yeah, Fruit Chan. Okay, and Fruit Chan, um, they did a feature version of Dumplings, which really tried to expand on some of this stuff. But in the end, I feel like it was not nearly as successful as The Short was the things that the short was able to achieve. Uh, now, I'm not sure if that was just because it was wrapped with other strong stories that held up on their own, or if it was just, you know, it, the, the material itself couldn't withstand the, the you know, 90 minutes or uh, 100 minutes that it took to, to get to the points. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine that anything that works really well at 30 minutes is going to also work well at 90 minutes, and vice versa, you know, but... I, it would be interesting to see how many different variations you could cut of something that were still effective. I, I mean, it's an experiment that somebody's probably done, but I haven't seen it. Right. And this is a film that's actually, uh, the three extremes actually is something you can find on DVD. If you're interested, we highly recommend it. Uh, it does provide a wealth of different, uh, Asian filmmaking voices. It's kind of like a food court of, uh, Asian horror films in that way. So that's, again, that's something that is available on DVD and definitely track it down. Uh, to bring up something that's definitely not on DVD, uh, I'd like to talk for a minute about Blood Beach. Are you are you guys familiar with Blood Beach? Uh, I've seen it and forgotten it. <laughs> what, what I mainly remember about it, though, is uh, the amazing uh, video box cover, which yes. I used to see at the local Giant Eagle video store all the time and wanted to rent. And I never saw it until I was an adult and then immediately forgot what it. What was your impression of that cover? Um, my impression of it, it was, it's a, a woman emerging from the sand mm-hmm. and, you know, it says blood beach and she's screaming. You can tell that she's being sucked, pulled into the sand and she's also designed to look appealing, but in that very eighties way with like the, the hair that's a little bit too big mm-hmm. and the color is really popping on her bathing suit. And I just remember as a kid, you know, this, I was pre-sexual at the time. So this girl being in a bathing suit meant nothing to me, (laughs) but I I just remember like looking at that girl and her reaction and thinking, uh, yeah, I want to see that happen to her. Yeah. Basically this was one of the strangest Jaws ripoffs that I think I've ever come across because they decided that instead of the threat being in the water, they were going to put the threat under the sand. So again, we kind of have another weird tremors connection here where it was basically this evil worm thing that lived under the sand on the beach and in fact they uh, repurposed I guess we should say creatively a tagline from Jaws uh, actually Jaws 2 I believe which was just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water they their tagline was just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water you can't get to it so it was I mean, it's a movie that stars John Saxon who if you're not familiar with John Saxon he's the reason to watch a lot of these movies he's the reason that we dig through titles we don't know and take chances on movies we're not familiar with just in the slight glimmer of a chance that we'll catch John Saxon in something. Uh, He was the sheriff in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. He was also the sheriff in Black Christmas. He's the sheriff in Blood Beach. I think he's, I think he might be a a fantastic sheriff. Yeah. He may actually be a honorary sheriff. He may be part of law enforcement by this point, but yeah, it's, it's just a, a movie that has very little going for it, but what it does have it, it, you know, it, it, plays up and it makes up for a lot of its shortcomings and charm 
one of the things that I find so hilarious about it, though, is that it's as much a movie about city council red tape as it is about a monster worm living in the sand. There's these extended sequences of him trying to get a permit to close the beach. Mm. Uh, imagine that scene from Jaws where Richard Dreyfuss is arguing that you, you are going to ignore this particular problem until it swims up and bites you on the ass. Except in a committee for about 35 minutes. That's that's Blood Beach. I like uh, I like my uh, my horror with a little bit more bureaucracy. Yeah, no, definitely. It's something that's missing from a lot of horror films. Yeah, you do get the sense when you watch Blood Beach that it's somebody ripping off Jaws, but somebody who maybe doesn't understand what is appealing about Jaws. Like or they, saw the Jaws poster. Yeah, <laughs> they, they take all of the elements that people like the least from Jaws and really play up those elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will say this, though. It has one of the best castration scenes I've ever seen in a horror film. It's a, uh, a gentleman who resides under the boardwalk and is attacking a woman. Uh, he falls down, and as he's lying face down in the sand, he starts this this hellish scream, and he rolls over, and his crotch is covered in blood. Uh, it is kind of a poetic justice, but also in a very kitschy 80s type way that I really enjoy. Would you consider like Tremors to be a Jaws ripoff, or do you think it is something unto itself that just utilizes some of that fear and the uh, familiar space that normally we consider safe. I wouldn't consider Tremors a Jaws ripoff only because it, it the only trope that it really shares with Jaws is the one that you mentioned. Uh, beyond that, it is it is a very different film that I don't feel I don't feel it's it's using the popularity of Jaws to sell itself. I, I really do think it establishes its own voice, whereas something like Blood Beach is. So desperately trying to capitalize on Jaws that, as we mentioned, they they just stole the tagline and uh, and then a lot of the scenes and with a very poor understanding or tenuous understanding of what those scenes are supposed to represent. Uh, but yeah, it's a movie that uh, I think you'll enjoy quite a bit if you can track down a copy on media. Uh, it's a media release VHS. Uh, I have a question for you, gentlemen, and that would be specifically when it comes to uh, shot on video material. Do you like what's shot on video that, for what it's trying to be, you know, when a shot on video uh, whore is trying to be Jaws, or do you like what uh, a shot on video movie achieves onto itself that is wholly unique and, uh, and different than the movie? Is, is it what it's, it's incapable of fully achieving, or is it what it achieves on its own somehow despite being so low budget and... It's probably more of the latter, but I think what I like most about shot on video movies is I think they are things that probably weren't intended. I think when you look at a movie like Sledgehammer, there are very stylized sequences that are clearly intended to recreate uh, things that they had seen in more uh, polished horror films. Mm -hmm. And the result is not something that feels like what they were going for, which is, you know, a recreation of those horror movies. But it doesn't really feel like some amateurish attempt either. It ends up in this weird sort of negative space of its own, and it becomes sort of hypnotic. And those right. are, that's a quality that all of my favorite shot on video films have, is that probably more by accident than anything else, the look and the feel of it uh, is alien and other in a way that is very compelling to watch, almost like you're watching uh, home movies from an alternate dimension. <laughs> yeah, Sledgehammer is definitely one of those videos that I can't think of something else that it likens to like maybe boogeyman or some kind of early slasher but not really even well i think that's because it has to in order for a movie to rip off another movie it has to stop moving long enough for you to grasp what it's stealing from and sledgehammer is a movie that never stops moving and i don't necessarily mean that as a compliment it feels like they can't settle on any particular theme or tone or Comp shot composition <laughs> so they're literally just moving through this house trying to use as much space as possible because it's it's and it's a it's a weird kind of native american approach it's like we're going to use every part of this shitty little house because it's the only location we can pay for and every way that you could explore a death by a sledgehammer yes which, which there is, turns out to be quite a few yeah i would not think but <laughs> but there you have indeed, it there are many ways you could sledge somebody indeed and the, the funny thing about uh the shot on video horror films is that uh when you get to the level of something like sledgehammer you realize that as awful as these movies are there is something uh admirable about the fact that it allowed for any joe schmo to pick up a camera and be a filmmaker and it, it's kind of the the shared experience of you know why we go to the movies why we love movies i mean people who love movies so much that you know God love them, even if they have no idea what they're doing, have the ability to pick up a camera and at least try to make something 
uh, oh, of yeah. their own. Oh yeah, when the wall wall came down, it was when we were able to get that strap on uh, VHS uh, container that you can attach to. <laughs> I love that you waited so long to strap the container. on. <laughs> Let me emphasize strapping it on, and then put a pause and before then, the end. <laughs> Just the, the second that you're able to record onto that VHS and then dupe it and then all, you know, for the cost of just two or just a VCR and your camcorder, you could be an editor all of a sudden, you know, it, it brought some barriers down. Yeah. And, and what, you know, whether you're on board with what that yielded or not, I, I think there's something admirable about that. I think there's something uh, very touching about it. It's, it's definitely something homegrown that's yeah. not as effective as the... You know the Hollywood system, or even the uh, the film school. System. It's the independent, independent film scene. <laughs> yeah, there's no more independent. I think you can get than that. Well, it's not just independent. It's very blue collar. It's mm -hmm. very much like the working person's format. You know, both in terms of bringing it into the home. I mean, uh, videotapes were originally rented out of gas stations. You would stop to fill up your tank, and then you would get something from behind the counter. Yep. And then the average American at a certain point in the mid '80s could make and distribute a film on a very limited scale. But I mean, it immediately put the working class person in a position to both consume and put out uh, filmed art, which yeah. is something that literally was impossible even six years before that. Yeah, Absolutely, truly, on a you know a limited pension salary, you could afford to buy a few thousand, you know, you know, may have a few thousand copies of your whole movie made and drop it off at some local rental stores, which were all mom and pop. You know, for a lot of this period of time before, it was blockbuster everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there were still some places with these very obscure, um, made-on-video, doesn't exist outside of these local areas, kind of uh, uh, horror movies. Like, one specific one that I love is uh, Marley's Revenge. From North Carolina. From North that's Carolina. The, that's the follow-up to Marley and Me, yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, but much more alligator-related. <laughs> well, I'm on board already. Tell me more. It's made in North Carolina, just a regionally produced and probably only regionally distributed film. I mean, it was released on video, but I don't know that you could get this anywhere in the country after it was put out. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there's a sticker on the box that advertises that these local radio DJs make an appearance. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I just wonder about the marketing involved, thinking that this is the best way to, to get this out there. But maybe at the time, you know... Jimmy Joe or Billy Bob in the morning show is, you know, is the, that's big name. That's a big star to attach to your, your, you know. Yeah, so I mean, J-Bub and Billy in the morning is literally like a selling point on the that, front of that, the, Yeah, you know, absolutely. For that movie it is, yeah. Goodness gracious. Now, we didn't know that specific uh, morning show DJ, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. The, the creature that they created for what had to be... A hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, yeah, very um, small amount of money. Uh, just a limited amount of taxidermy with an alligator attached with some some leather made this horrifically awesome looking monster. I mean, I, would you agree with me yeah. on this one? That the monster looks damn good. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the monster is the highlight of the movie, which is true of a lot of monster movies, but mm -hmm. it's partially the highlight because that's where all of the budget and the actual talent went. Sure. But in sure. this case, I mean, it's really because it's just so unusual and inspired. They have this sort of taxidermy torso that towers above everybody and an alligator skull that they probably just procured somewhere locally stuck on top. And it, it's not sophisticated puppeteering. It doesn't really move or do a whole lot, but just as an image, it's so incongruent with everything else that you see in the film that mm -hmm. it actually kind of gets under your skin in a weird way. And that's the great thing about practical effects is like there were a lot of times, especially in the 80s, where it's like no matter the meagerness of the budget, they were able to kind of like MacGyver just put together something out of nothing and create these really effective looking monsters. I've seen monster movies that were released last year that got a theatrical release with practical effects that look like garbage. So it, it, it warms my heart a little bit that this movie we're talking about that probably only got a regional release in Palookaville, North Carolina with two radio DJs starring has an effective looking monster. Like there is still something, no matter how esoteric you get, there's still some value to be mined from it. And that's, that's why I think we collect VHS in the first place. Right. Well, when you get it right with practical effects, you make a good monster, you make a good piece of uh, gore, some fleshy bits that blow up or... Whatever it may be, when you get it right, it works, and it works for the next decade, and the next decade, and the next decade, and you know, 40 years later, you're still seeing this thing, and it looks still really good. Whereas if you make something that it looks cheap and overly uh, dependent on CGI, mm -hmm. and it just just does not 
look real. It's not going to look real then. It's not going to look real in five years. It's going to be a joke in 10 years and 20 years. Nobody wants to see that shit. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'm going to bring up uh, one that I, when I first started getting back into collecting VHS, was one of the first that ended up on my shelf. Uh, it's a movie called Blast Fighter, which is an Italian... Uh, if you're not familiar with this, there was a period in the 80s when all of Italian B-cinema was concentrated on stealing American box office smashes and repurposing them, repackaging them, and basically tricking people into going to see them. They were the they were the asylum of their day. Uh, they would just basically trick people into going to see this movie thinking they were seeing the actual film that it was aping. Um, Blast Fighter is among this category. It was directed by Lamberto Bava, who also did Demons and happens to be the son of, of Mario Bava, one of the most renowned horror filmmakers uh, who, who ever lived. Uh, and it stars Michael Sopkew, also of uh, After the Fall of New York, which I believe makes an appearance in the trailer for Rewind This, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the, the previous installment, 1990 Bronx Warriors. Ah, that's right. I'm yeah. sorry. That's correct. Uh, which is an Enzo Castellari movie. Uh, but yes, uh, so Blast Fighter is about a guy who goes back to his home. To, he gets out of jail. Uh, he was wrongfully put in jail. His his friend gives him the world's most versatile shotgun uh, so that he can go back to his hometown and get vengeance. And at first it seems like he's content to just live in the woods and be away from everybody, kind of very Rambo. But then the locals make the mistake of having improper hunting practices, which really piss him off. Thus leading to one of the biggest bloodbaths in 80s VHS action movies I think I've ever seen. All because these hunters are not killing their prey outright, they're letting them suffer, and that pisses him off, so he kills them all. Well, I like that. I like a, a noble warrior with, uh, with you know, rules. Well, but I mean, much like Blood Beach and its, its uh, preponderance of city council meetings and bureaucracy, this is a movie about how improper hunting practices will get you slaughtered by a crazy Italian man. So it's got a message. It does have a message. It is it is a weird Italian ripoff of uh, First Blood because he's living in the woods. He starts to set traps for these guys. I mean, it, it all just it, it's a very strange movie, and it kind of has a little bit of a walking tall element in there as well. Uh, it's one I highly recommend. It's it's very weird, very bizarre, but uh, ultimately one of my favorites. There's a really good uh, movie that's trapped on VHS, unfortunately, uh, made by AIP called Elves. <laughs> and if you haven't seen it, it's also one of the stranger horror movies. It deals with an elf that uh, a former Nazi wants to use to impregnate uh, his own, I think it's either granddaughter or stepdaughter. It's his daughter by his own daughter. It, it, yeah, there's a weird incest secondary storyline going on there. So it's an incestuous Nazi elf movie set around the holidays. Mm -hmm. Like and, you do. And your hero, of course, is a mall Santa. Played by Dan Haggerty of uh, Grizzly Adams. Adams. Yeah. Yes. So that is a wonderfully perverse movie that I just recently took a first date on. Ooh, and uh, how'd that turn out? It, it turned out pretty well. It turned out as good as you can expect for having taken somebody Did to Did she that call you the next day? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, you for trying. I know. I, I, applaud, I, I applaud the big steely balls that you had to take well, into I, I figured, this as a first day. Yeah, I figured it would really get it out in the open right away that this is the sort of individual that I am. Kind of the door in the face yeah, technique. Yeah, there's no reason yeah. to hide it, you know. Yeah. No, I am proud of my love of incestuous Nazi elves. Yeah. Hey, and who yeah. who isn't? And one of the things about elves, um, and for more of my thoughts, you can I actually reviewed it for Junk Food Cinema a few weeks ago uh, during the Christmas season. Uh, one of the things I love about it is that Dan Haggerty has to be cinema's most apathetic hero. He there's literally a scene mm. where there's a shootout in the mall in the in the store with these Nazis, and he doesn't even bother to take his cigarette out of his mouth. But not in a like cool Humphrey Bogart type way, but in a way it's like, oh man, I got like five more minutes on my break. I didn't, you know what? I'll just, I'll just smoke this. So he kind of lumbers along from one place to another, aimlessly firing his gun and taking a drag on a cigarette. And you can just, you can just feel the shits he doesn't give, just mm -hmm. emanating from the screen. Yeah, it, I like, I like an apathetic lean man, which is uh, something we also had in uh, a point of fear. The the main detective, this hard boiled detective, is so hard boiled. He hardly gives a shit that he keeps lighting his car on fire. <laughs> yeah, there are two separate sequences of him disposing of a cigarette butt 
accidentally into his own car <laughs> and causing it to start smoking. You know, speaking of apathetic uh, leading men, there's a great movie that I believe is trapped on videotape, although it's not a horror movie, it's an action movie, and kind of a weird black exploitation movie. It's called Redneck Miller, and it has one of the most memorable scenes ever where this guy, who you know is the hero of the movie, uh, basically says to uh, the lady love or the lady that he's interested in, you know, basically defends the fact that he didn't jump in and get between her and a bullet uh, in order to prevent her from being raped by saying, girl, you can take a whole lot of loving, but I can only get killed once. This, these Damn. are words to live by. These are definitely words to live by. Yeah, that's a vil- or that's a you know a good guy who doesn't need to be that good, obviously. Well, I just like how cavalier he is about it. Like, he doesn't even try to pass it off. Like, he's, you know, a, a more brave individual. He just kind of puts it out there. Like, yeah, you can get raped for a little while, but I'm going to get dead for good. That's also so. hard-boiled. That's, in fact, hardcore hard-boiled. I, I, don't think I, I don't think I'm quite prepared for that level of hard-boiled. That's pretty badass. That reminds me of the human tornado. Uh, Rudy Ray Moore. Yeah, Rudy Ray Moore. <laughs> and, and that he himself did not look like he gave a shit. I uh, gave a shit through the whole thing. He was just there. Uh, he didn't look like he bothered to work out. Uh, he didn't. He didn't really bother to do much. But he was just ready to be badass. Yeah, and this is this is what happens when we start talking about VHS. Is that we'll just we'll just start regaling our, each other with our favorite titles, no matter what the genre, because there's so much out there that for whatever reason, despite the fact that newer and, in my opinion, worse movies are being released in theaters every day and will automatically get a DVD release. I mean, these are stuck in this uh, this older format, but quite frankly, it doesn't cost them much to get a VCR. These tapes are not going to run you, you know, they're not going to bankrupt you. Um, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to track down these movies and watch them on VHS, and there's no reason you shouldn't enjoy that process. And I, I kind of feel like that's something that's celebrated in Rewind This, so... Can you guys tell us a little bit about uh, where where the film is right now? Uh, the film is about 90% of the way through production. There's a couple uh, more production trips that we have. We're going to Japan in order to capture a week's worth of material there. And we're actually doing this fundraising process right now. And if we get uh, a little bit of extra fund, and we've already met our goal for Japan, if we get a little extra, we're going to do a weekend trip to Toronto. And I actually talked to some people in Canada today that we're hoping to talk to if we can make that happen. Very yeah, cool. but we have about uh, about 69, 70 hours already of just fantastic interview material and B-roll. And, um, and really, you know, we are looking forward to some new angles. I mean, it's, as we edit the stuff, we're constantly kind of discovering new angles. That's the thing that's really exciting about the documentary format, I find, is that the more you delve into it, the more you can kind of like, well, let's explore a little bit more of this rental thing, or let's explore a little bit more of this what's directly shot on video or something that I right now I'm really interested in is what, what appeals to our community specifically when it comes to uh, shot on video stuff. Is it the scarcity mm -hmm. of it? Is it the fact that you have to kind of hunt it down to find it? Uh, or is it that it just somehow missed the jump to DVD or Blu-ray, you know, in, in that, you know, larger studios didn't see it appropriate necessarily to put up on, uh, other physical formats and upgrade it, mm -hmm. or maybe it does not, you know, exist on Netflix. Is it, you know, is it the hunt? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe because I think part of the the thing that excites me is the rarity to say yeah. that I saw this movie that refuses, you know, that is not on any other format. You you feel like a cinema anthropologist at that point, like you're you're out digging in the sand and you you turn up these artifacts that no one has probably seen in in ages. And you're right, there is a little bit of a, of a satisfaction to that, not in a not in a smug way, not in an I've seen something you haven't, but just in a I am in a position to to see things that you know were largely thought lost. Right. It really is like you do kind of feel like Indiana Jones in the in the temple. Yeah, I think you know for our culture, this sort of uh, film archaeologist culture is we're not so much looking to explore the established classics of cinema history. We're looking to explore the things that slip between the cracks of the cracks. We're looking for things that were never well regarded right. and you know, finding was valuable about them. So whereas somebody who's maybe a film student or just uh, somebody interested in learning about movies, what they're doing is exploring. You know, We're doing excavating. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a different uh, outlook, but I think one of the exciting things about searching for videotapes is finding something that you've never heard of 
that nobody knows has ever heard of and watching it and finding that there's real value in it. And that's what excites you to keep digging and keep looking for this stuff. Well, yeah. And then we're not going to pretend like it's this weird hipster thing where like only content that's on VHS that only involves things that most people are not going to be able to see is the only kind of concept that I'm into, you know, I'm sure we're all into, you know, totally different kinds of action, adventure, fantasy, sci-fi, you know, drama, and any, any number of things. But there is something to be said about this, uh, this lesser known, forgotten, almost, almost kind of throwaway uh, format that a lot of people are like, well, I just give, I gave my VCR away. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear that all the time. People have said, you know, I think I have one. No, wait, I gave it away. I gave it to Goodwill. But, you know, well, maybe it was a compromised way of seeing things. Maybe, you know, maybe DVD or Blu-ray is the better way of seeing this movie. But if it only exists on that format, I, I, I say you're only really a true film lover if you accept that there's some great stuff out there on VHS and only on VHS. And the great thing about VHS from a horror standpoint is that it was the technology, it was the format that fostered this whole new generation of, uh, frankly, learned and, and even more passionate fans because for the first time this stuff was just, it not only was it widely available, but it, the covers, the VHS covers just hooked so many of us. I remember I used to go to my video store and I would just grab whatever looked the scariest based on the cover. And that's how I ended up discovering some of the movies that to this day are, you know, counted among my favorites. And that's, that's something that I think is so amazing about VHS uh, being a horror fan is that it did make a lot of things available that weren't one. And it gave us, it gave us something to reach for and it, it put them right in front of us. And it put everything that was great and everything that was weird and wonderful about this genre that we love unconditionally right there in our faces at eye level on these shelves. Well, it puts you in control. You know, you can go to the, I mean, I remember seeing Jurassic Park, I don't know how many times, maybe five times in the theater, but mm -hmm. once you had the Jurassic Park VHS at home, you can kind of put together how they made that shot, how they made that scare. Yeah. You could break it down frame by frame, and all of a sudden you have this deeper understanding of editing. Yeah. And there was sort of a badge of honor element to VHS too, uh, showing your love for a particular movie. Is I've heard this so many times: is oh, I watched that movie until I wore it out, until I couldn't watch it anymore. And you know, a lot of people would would count that among like the faults of the format. But I'm like, no, that to me is a very tangible, uh, you know, badge of honor as to being a cinephile. Is like I literally love this movie so much that I watched it to the point that it was no longer uh, able to function. Do you mind when you get a tape that you know is well loved? You know, there's all this wear before and after, some horrific moments or some boobs and gore. You know, do you, does that bother you, or do you want to have? Are you like the guy who wants to have the the cleanest vinyl record? No, and I think it's it's one of those things. It, there's a there's a fine line there because if, one, I don't need it to be pristine. If I was uh, if I was a stickler for pristine picture and sound. I probably wouldn't be watching VHS in the first place. Right. I don't mind. I don't mind it having tracking problems and, and obviously being well loved. I obviously would prefer that I could still see to a large extent what is happening in the movie. So I mean, I'm I'm not the kind of person that thinks that the more well loved it is, the more as someone who's buying it secondhand, the more value it has to me. However, I do kind of relish that. And my one of my favorite things though is when you buy a tape and it has someone's name written on it. Somebody uh, loved that tape yes. enough to to brand it yeah. and say that this is my copy of Blood Beach right. or this is my copy of New Year's Evil. Like that, that to me is is just a, a clear, perfect little picture of how much VHS meant to an entire generation of fans. Right. In addition to CDs, I like collecting records, and I'm not going to make the comparison to say that vinyl records are the same thing as VHS mm -hmm. because arguably vinyl records are a higher quality than you're going to get off a CD. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one, one thing I don't mind so much, and I see a comparison between VHS and vinyl records, is the, the texture of mm -hmm. the vinyl and, and the scratches and the pops and the things that make my record a unique record. Sure. Just like the things that make my VHS tape a unique VHS tape that's just got wear in these particular areas. You know, and of course, you've got to be able to see the image. I've seen the fog before on a... Uh, VHS tape that was used to death and, and what must have been gears grinding this thing to, to a bloody pulp mm -hmm. inside other VCRs. But, you know, it, there's still something kind of beautiful about, uh, especially when it comes to obscuring uh, horror imagery, mm -hmm. 
you know, that you're like, what, what is that? Is that the, is that the fog? Or is that somebody's arm? Is that, you know, is that a, a, a sickle? You know, <laughs> not sure what's going on here, but almost, you know, you buy that horror that much more. You know, mm-hmm. when you see Cannibal Holocaust, you see on a uh, fourth generation VHS tape, that shit looks real. <laughs> you know? Now you see it on the a strings ni- are more obscured yeah. because of the generations of love that it's had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you see it on uh, a nice pristine DVD, and all of a sudden, wait a second, this looks like silliness. And, uh, <laughs> yes, finally. Why was this finally, so Cannibal doing? Holocaust looks silly on DVD. <laughs> uh, well, gentlemen, I really do want to thank you for being here. Is there anything else that you would kind of want to end on as far as the documentary goes? Uh, just that we're in the process of wrapping it up and we're excited to share it with people and thanks to anybody who's listening to this and contributed to the Kickstarter campaign, which was an amazing success. We reached our goal in 112 hours. Wow. And at this point, anything that we make over that amount is going straight into the production of the film to just do things we didn't think we could do to make it even better. So, uh, rewindthismovie.com is where you can find out about it. Go there. Yeah, uh, rewindthismovie.com. Check it out. We'll have regular updates. And, you know, we're trying to make this really something that the community can be proud of. And that's the whole video community, you know? Definitely. And and we'll definitely have links to both uh, the website as well as the the trailer that was recently released and is, is outstanding. Uh, it's one of those... Uh, you don't see a lot of trailers for documentaries that get you as excited as trailers for... Uh, narrative releases, but I got to say, watching the trailer for Rewind This, partially from being a VHS nerd myself, was I was uh, I was all a tingle. So I think you guys did, a, did an amazing job editing that, and putting that together. Tingo, all a tingle. Uh, so we will have that up as well. Uh, Josh Johnson, Christopher Palmer, I want to thank you both for being on Hatchetman, and uh, thanks so much for having us. Absolutely, yeah, and I think it. we'll uh, we'll go out on a uh, on a toast here today, as we always do. Uh, so I think today we're going to toast uh, Viva VHS. Viva VHS. Viva VHS. Thank you for playing.